speakers, Nicholas and Lenz, who will introduce each other anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Good morning. I am this. I'm Nicholas, the guy with the Hungarian surname, but uh, I was born in Uruguay. And uh, actually, I'm a New Zealander, so I married a clinical psychologist, and she helped me with the identity crisis. And here is Lenz, who is uh, German, born in Austria, also living in New Zealand. So we are who we are, I'm sorry. But what it matters is, I guess, what we do. And Open Parallel, it's an uh, ecosystem, a company that we are organizing. And we do specialist uh, projects, essentially, for uh, communities or big corporations. To be honest, to whoever pays us. And uh, what we want to present you is this specific project that we did along the whole uh, good part of 2010 and 2011. And before that, uh, we will introduce you why this is around the multi-core and parallel programming. So we will give you, uh, hello, yes. So this is what the presentation is about. Uh, I will give a general introduction about what is this multi-core hardware chips and why parallel programming is uh, the solution. I will explain about the open parallel ecosystem and obviously invite you to join us. And uh, then Lens will take the hardcore part and hopefully we will be able even to show you something live or not. And we will end explaining you how our long-term strategy is uh, progressing, something that we started a few years ago. So here are business cards, a small leaflet. And um, please feel free to interrupt any time. We are not shy. We are not humble. So. And by the way, thank you very much, all of you, for being here. I know that we are competing against other presentations. So off we go. Well, sorry, I was expecting here to change. Right, so let's tell you a story. If Bruce parents just read the slides, I can read a few slides, too. But this is a nice story, <clears throat> and uh, I, I strongly encourage you just to read it together. So uh, we have a programming, a software crisis. We have a problem, and we wouldn't have that problem if we didn't have machines to program. I mean, 30 years ago, I was lecturing mathematics. And believe me, a piece of chalk and the blackboard, that was, if not romantic, it was at least historic. Computers made a problem. Oops. And we have this issue that uh, vendors and manufacturers are creating hardware that we just need to learn how to program. And the interesting thing is that the power that these machines have, it's something that we need to handle that. Let me uh, highlight. I learned Fortran 30 years ago, uh, but I'm an entrepreneur. So I forgot Fortran 29 years ago. I remember go to, which is helpful to go to the bathroom or whatever. But uh, what are we building here is an ecosystem of, uh, in the area of multi-core and parallel computing. So uh, this was part of a Turing lecture from a gentleman with Dutch surname, Edgar Dijkstra. The interesting thing that he said this in 1972. And why I am quoting this story, because it's pretty much the same what's happening to us today. We have extremely powerful hardware, and we are just behind on how to take advantage of that. So there is software crisis after crisis. And what is this multi-core hardware? Well, this lovely laptop that I have here has two or four cores. But uh, why we have this core situation? Because after Moore's law was giving crappy code developers always a solution year after year, 
by saying, whatever your performance is, I will give you a way to speed up next year. This doesn't work anymore for the last five or six years. And uh, why? Because nature, heat, dissipation. So if you want to read more about this, there is an interesting short paper, absolutely in a general, general way. But the challenge is how to take advantage of these uh, chips. Why are we concerned about it? Because we can start to do things that we never thought that we are able to do before. Again, this has four cores, perhaps. 705,024 cores has a supercomputer, which is the fastest and best performance. Uh, and there is a list of uh, top 500 about supercomputers. Then you can ask me, why are you talking about supercomputers? Why high performance computing in, uh, this is not scientific computing. Well, the story is that hardware, it's coming to our budgets. Today, you can buy actually a supercomputer and uh, the software to run it, either from Red Hat, will cost you pretty much the same. So you actually can have an extremely powerful hardware for a cost that was absolutely unheard before. So what we are thinking is not only to do things faster, but things that you haven't thought before. And there are incredible projects, and there is one that involves Australia and New Zealand, for example, the Square Kilometer Array, the SKA, which will, uh, I don't know, track data back to the Big Bang. And the amount of data that needs to be processed daily, someone say that it's equivalent to what the internet is processing on its entire 40 years of history. So we're talking about big things, which means that we're talking about the internet of things, the big data, all these trendy names that are around, but someone needs to process that information and software needs to be written and we have the hardware. So it's time to take some decisions. And those decisions could go through one way or other. Sequential programming is dead. Sequential programming is dead. And if it's not dead today, it will be tomorrow or yesterday. We need to go to learn certain ways to parallelize to take advantage of existing hardware. So you need to take some decision about how to reach that and you need to be aware that parallelism is already with us. It's already with us everywhere. And we would love to believe that it's nice and shiny with a beautiful blue sky, everyone going in parallel, everyone coming, love and peace. But it's not like that. <laughs> so, and even if you don't see that, you see that jamming up there. So, uh, it's not that simple. It's not that today I was in one world and then I shifted to other world. It's not that I have a holy grail that says, Let's, this is my software that parallelizes automatically everything. It's just not that simple. So sometimes it's better to ask someone else to speak on my behalf. So this couple of gentlemen has another paper. And what they say is that parallelism is not new. But the realization that it's essential for HPC high performance computing is. Again, high performance computing is not anymore on the realm of science. You don't need necessarily to have a PhD in computer science to deal with it. The hardware, it's really available. But the question is how we will deal with this. And there is a lot of research and a lot of information available and a lot of people have been trying to find the right language. So these are languages for parallel programming. And someone say that there are actually 200 of them. So what I put in bold, this is after half morning of research, what I put in bold are the names that uh, I heard about it, people on our team know how to do, but mm, there is just a wealth of options, which doesn't mean that we have a wealth of solutions. So as an entrepreneur, it's my dream 
there is a big gap in the market. There is a big problem that we can uh, address it. So forget technology, forget software, simple business. There is a need, I will try to provide a solution. Simple like that. And the problem is precisely here. Uh, this, uh, these four horses are here. In one way or other, the legacy code is taking advantage of the course here, but sometimes even goes slower. The challenge is to use these new uh, chips, which, believe me, are cheaper, faster, perform better, but you need to know how to program them. So in terms of change, you need to make decisions. And probably in a team or in a boardroom, you are the only one who has an idea because everyone else believes that the status quo is how it is and should stay like that forever. And OK, this is my daughter. She will hate me because I am showing this photo. But the point is we need to find a way to create solutions to this problem. Uh, Open Parallel, it's a company, but essentially it's an ecosystem which integrates entrepreneurs, engineers, developers, academia, investors. I want to call it our own virtual incubator, our own virtual Silicon Valley. We want addressing, we want lecture about, yes, there is a distributed world. Well, actually we believe that the only way to address this uh, software problem is through the business model, if we can call it, of the open source uh, community, integrated with a lot of other solutions. So this is a direct invitation to everyone in the room or who is watching to join us. And from here, we will explain a specific <coughs> project about how we did this lens. So, um, is that on? All good? Good. Do you want this? Um, let's talk about the actual technical stuff now. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> we've done a project with uh, TBB because we think TBB is a really, really good library to actually address a lot of uh, parallel programming issues. Um, it's been written by um, Intel, but it is open sourced and it is actually um, open sourced in a way that you can even relabel it and resell it. Um, I think Microsoft resells their threading library um, as as a as a direct copy of the of the actual Intel project. So it is it is um, relabelable or however you call that. <laughs> but it is actually a, a really really interesting project because Intel obviously wants to sell chips with many cores, and uh, they thought, how can we? probably make that a bit easier and approachable, more approachable for, for average developers um, without trying to um, make them know everything about um, how hard it is to synchronize threads and all that kind of stuff. So they came up with TBB and TBB is um, a C++ library that gives you um, a task-based um, interface towards uh, addressing multi-core problems. So you can basically track up your, your project in multiple tasks uh, and make those task, uh, tasks communicate uh, via, via queues. And um, they give you all the, the, the mechanics for it um, so that it is really pretty simple to actually do that without um, having to worry about synchronization, without having to worry about shared memory and all those kind of things. Um, so, we love this approach, but it is C++. Um, C++ is not exactly the language that is uh, used on the web, and the web is, from my perspective, the more important bit of the internet, because we know how to program servers, but that's something that a minority does. The majority on the web development is, is done in, in app servers and, and on websites and stuff. So we try to bring TBB to a more, to a wider audience. And um, sorry. Uh, and we we tried to get it into into PB, uh, PHP. The problem with PHP is um, it doesn't thread at all, at least not send PHP. Um, we we actually started to uh, 
to implement um, or to try to hack the, the send um, PHP runtime to, to thread properly, but people tried it before us and also we failed. <laughs> Um, so it's, it hasn't been done yet, and uh, there is there is n have not been many encouraging words from the core developers that it will ever work. So we set out to actually hack PA, uh, hip hop, which is um, a project that a small startup has written called Facebook. Um, they had the same problem. Um, PHP works nicely. Uh, the problem is only uh, performance is suboptimal. Uh, if the site gets bigger. So they came up with HipHop, which is a PHP to C++ compiler, uh, which fits pretty much exactly our needs, because C++ is also um, a thing TVB is written in, so we, can, we, we thought we can probably really, really easily just sort of sneak into the, the language interpreter of HipHop and um, imp uh, implement a couple new commands, like parallel for, parallel reuse and stuff, to, um, to just uh, Modify the commands or the, uh, the 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 naming uh, the namespace of of PHP, and um, and give PHP the the ability to to do, for example, a parallel for over an array um, on multiple CPUs. Turned out it wasn't that straightforward, but we managed to do it. Hacked it in, added TB, uh, TBB to to hip hop and. Um, actually uh, added a subset of the TBB library as an initial step to just try to, to evaluate if it works at all. We have currently in there uh, parallel 4 and a parallel reduce, and we have all the, the, the data structures that we need to, to deal with them in a way that TBB can actually make sure that we are using multiple cores and the shared memory is used uh, efficiently and all that. So why? Well, Hip hop is already something that is used by not only by Facebook but by a couple of other large players, and it doesn't address the the sort of I don't want to say normal, but the the the, the guy who who implements three lines of PHP in his static PHP uh, static HTML website um, to implement a counter or update a date. It is already addressing a very tech savvy savvy audience already. So we thought it's probably the right audience to actually address. Um, the multi-core problem as well, because they are already performance conscious, they are already sort of open for the problem. And um, we, we wanted to give them uh, an opportunity to, to execute tasks in parallel, to actually go through the code base, look for parallel for, or for side effect uh, free for loops and, and run them in parallel. And do that efficient uh, thanks to TBB and hip hop, and do that in a stable way thanks to TBB, because um, TBB already takes care of the, all the memory management and locking and things. So, effectively, we have threaded PHP if we run under hip hop, and um, it <laughs> it surprisingly works, <laughs> <laughs> pretty pretty um, painless, and uh, the the TBB thing made it doable for us because if we would have uh, actually needed to set out and, and program all the, the, the really hard threading and locking stuff, we would pretty sure have failed somewhere down the track. Um, we played around with uh, WordPress and a couple of other projects, but um, just to, to stick with the WordPress um, hack that we did, we, we replaced one for loop that uh, initializes all the modules um, with a parallel for because the initialization of the modules is for the most part side effect free so we, we, we thought we can probably just speed it up by, by loading them all in parallel and um, on an 8 core CPU we got a 7 times speed up in the, in the page rendering so we, we really dramatically speeded it up and um, the interesting bit is if you compare it to, uh, to a normal uh, Apache based setup where you run mod PHP and um, you dramatically drop your resource usage because uh, you only need a, a very, very slim front end layer like Nginx or any of the other really slim web servers. And behind that, you're actually running machine, co uh, machine code because you have C that is compiled down to, to a real binary. So you're, you're not interpreting anything on the fly anymore. You're not interpreting a, a PHP source. You're really running a real Unix binary. And um, that, 
that speeds up the the page load times immensely and drops drops the um, the, the the resource usage as well. That was the first project. But PHP isn't the only language that's used on the web. Perl is another one that is still very, very widely used, um, even though Ruby is sort of taking over more and more um, of that space. But um, Perl is still used in a lot of really large legacy code bases and also in a, in a number of really big sites. So we tried to make threaded Perl. And threading interpreters isn't something that is incredibly straightforward. Um, there are a lot of problems when you try to thread an interpreter. And um, the PHP guys already said, like, PHP doesn't work. Uh, we tried it with Perl because there is already threaded Perl. We thought maybe that would work. Uh, and we came up with uh, something called Threads TBB, which is um, a new threading approach to Perl because the one threading approach that we have in Perl at the moment is sort of supported-ish, but um, is not really used widely. There is an older version um, that uh, was tripped out a couple of releases ago um, and replaced with the current version, which failed horribly. And um, we thought we can probably base it on TBB as well because uh, it already worked for hip hop. We can probably try it in here as well. Um, turned out that it is it isn't straightforward because um, the startup cost of a new interpreter is really really expensive. And we tried to get around that with something called deep cloning. So we tried to actually avoid deep cloning by um, only copying the, the data, the, a very shallow um, copy of the data structures upon initialization of a new interpreter to, to reduce the startup cost and only copy the full data structure if we actually need it. Because a lot of times you carry a lo uh, along a, uh, a lot of data structures um, that you actually don't need in that very step and you're processing in the moment. But for a complete interpreter startup, you actually have to carry them over. Um, so we, we tried to get around that and we got uh, a massive speed up in, in interpreter startup and therefore uh, a bigger gain in threading, um, threading projects. Um, we still have a startup cost but uh, the startup cost is only once, and after that, the interpreters keep running. So we can just add things to them and tasks to them. And um, we have that, inter uh, that startup cost only once. And uh, this is a model that can definitely work for other interpreters as well. So if anyone in here is actually imp uh, implementing interpreters or trying to, to thread an interpreted language, uh, look at threads TBB and the underlying C code that is in there on how we actually went about um, doing all that stuff. Uh, we have a couple of demos up on geopic.me. Uh, there is a Perl demo on geopic.me slash Perl, which is really nicely. Um, the hip hop demo, uh, I tried it right now, uh, just before, and it try seems to not pick up any images from Twitter. It is uh, a Twitter feed that is passed for images, but I don't know. Either there are no geocoded Twitter, uh, Twitter images around here, or <laughs> it just doesn't pick it up. What it does is um, it picks your current location um, with the HTML5 uh, tag um, and um, passes that on to our API, um, either the Perl one or the, the hip hop one, and uh, tries to find images and then does scaling on the images, and um, just, just as a really little gimmicky project. The background for the project was that I always hate to look at some scientific paper. I, I want to actually have code in front of me and, and play with code. And uh, that is sort of the only thing that is true to me because anyone can write uh, every, anything up. And um, yeah, I, I don't trust anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I only trust code that's <laughs> provable. <laughs> so that's why we have geopic.me. It's all uh, the code base is, in, um, is uh, entirely in GitHub. So you can actually look at it. You can browse it in a, in a nice browser. and. It's all free, obviously. Um, future, parallel, we heard it before. Mm. Um, we have to accept that parallel is normal in the meantime. So if you have more than one CPU, you're running stuff in parallel. We already did that for many, many years, but we try to sort of hide that parallelism in the, in the operating system and um, came up with multitasking and all that stuff. And um, it, it is it is a normal operation mode that we are using for years already. We just try to not use it in our own code. Mm -hmm. 
Um, consumer grade CPUs are multi core CPUs in the meantime. And we have to we have to know how to program them. And we have to know how to use them. The impl the, the simple way is to just fire up five demons of the same thing and try to make them sort out their problems and program around the problems in, in, in the application code. Um, but that's definitely not how it will work in the future because if you have 20 or 50 uh, cores in your, in your laptop, you probably have to, or in your server, your, your sysadmins will probably force you to actually use them mm. because they are not paying for them to just idle around. Mm. So parallel execution as default model, threading and message passing is two models to actually address that problem. Um, there are more, but threading and, multi -pass, uh, and message passing is probably the, the, the most prominent ones. And um, just get into the mindset that even as a web developer, you probably have to deal with multi, multiple CPUs with a, uh, with a stack that supports or a language that supports um, more than one execution path. Um, think about problems that you could actually solve in parallel. So get up to date with everything multicore. Yeah, <laughs> so that's for you again. That's for me. Let me see if it works. So essentially, yeah, this is what we have done in the previous years. Um, so we started as a different company. This was at the time when we were had venture capital backing, and uh, the main demand for massive uh, use of the original multi-core chips was from telco. So we work with the. Uh, Netra division, we brought the first Niagara servers to New Zealand. It was an interesting story until 2008 came and happened what you probably know about Sun Microsystems and we follow. But uh, in, the, in the process, uh, the Otago University became the first uh, Open Spark Center of Excellence in the world outside the United States thanks to our community and the Testbed is still there, I'm not sure if they are using it. So that brought us to, to this big project that Len summarized here. And in order for us to keep growing and keep creating the awareness about parallel programming, we started to do uh, the mini comps. In, uh, we started in Wellington, then in Brisbane, and now we feel strong enough that we can organize our own conference on multicore. Uh, in the meantime, we, this is the, we are members of the New Zealand Square Kilometer Array Industry Consortium, which means anything else that we are the guys that raise the hand and say, look, whatever you want to do, someone needs to write the code for it. And there is a, a business component that say, we want to be those guys, but on the other hand, they say, don't dream so widely because whatever are you thinking, it's just not that simple to, to do. Uh, IBM has a, is tried to write a new language called Extend that we have been experimenting a little bit. And the, the purpose of this slide is just to give you a basic snapshot about a number of interests because, again, there is numbers of science here, but this is an absolutely day-to-day uh, -day, uh, project. So now I just want to finish doing a little bit of new marketing about uh, what are we aiming to do. And it's a sort of uh, get together in Wellington, the same place where LCA was in 2010. And what are we aiming to do, again, as a business and as uh, evangelization, as b keep building the ecosystem? It's that the guys that were sitting on that ballroom as tattoos, remember that slide, they start to realize that, look, if you want performance, if you want to cope with applications, you need to go parallel. And then you don't, e you don't need to ask just to your vendor. We can discuss this together. And a lot of people agreed on that to be speakers. And uh, these are the people who are coming from uh, Australia and United States just because they think that the concept is good. New Zealand is a nice place to visit too, so it has an excuse. But essentially, I mean, this guy, it's on the OpenCL group. This is the director of uh, the software division. This guy works in Boston. It's a Kiwi too. So it's an interesting lineup, but at the same time, what we are aiming to keep creating and pushing is an entire ecosystem, which means uh, we convince investors to come here. I mean, to, to, the, to the conference. Because at the end of the day, 
like every breakthrough, like everything new, someone needs to pay for it. Someone needs to take the risk. So uh, we are also inviting other developers to join. So it's more than a mm, talk fest. It's a gathering of uh, interest. And that was the purpose of our presentation, telling you a specific project on our ecosystem and how we have been working and how we will continue working. And I unashamedly will invite you again to our conference in a couple of months in beautiful Wellington, New Zealand. And here are leaflets and business cards. So I just want to thank you for your time. And we are open for questions. Thank you very much. Questions? Hi. Uh, what about mobile? I work yes. in mobile myself, and uh, I think the average mobile developer is probably still saying, ah, that stuff doesn't apply to me. It is. <laughs> so, now, essentially, the. Um, it's independent of its mobile desktop server. I mean, we can say it's in the cloud. And you can have your simple app, but the servers are in the cloud. And those clouds need to deal with massively things. And then you want to <laughs> Sorry. Um, mobile is pretty simple. Um, we, we are in mobile in the moment uh, at a stage where uh, the single CPU devices are still dominant. But uh, there are multiple uh, multi-CPU devices already coming up. Um, there, if for mobile, it depends very heavily if you use a framework that supports um, the underlying CPU architecture entirely with this multi-threading or not. Um, if you, if you, there is a couple of, of uh, sort of web frameworks that you can use on, on multiple platforms that probably just rely on a rendering engine that does the whole um, threading for you. If uh, if you're doing that, you're probably fine. If you're going native on iOS or Android and so on, um, I, I don't know Android too well, but I know on iOS uh, there is actually a threading library already um, that can be used, but um, I don't know when the first devices come out that actually have really a lot of CPUs or a lot of cores that it really starts to pay off to, to use multi threading. But it is definitely in the coming. It is probably just a year or two ahead instead of like being there right now for, for our consumer grade uh, CPUs uh, already. I, I think that the ARM has already multi-core chips on the mobile. Yeah. So I I'm, I'm can't remember if they are already they in the market. Yes. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, just with respect to the hip hop stuff you've done, and you talk about you know, unrolling mm -hmm. loops and things like that, um, is this just for you know one server which happens to have a quad core processor or something, or are you talking about a, a larger setup? Oh, it scales. Okay, because for instance, a lot of our websites we have uh, we might have a quad core processor, but we have so many virtual machines running on them that, for all intensive purposes, they're not going to get access to a whole bunch of separate threads to work on anyway. Um, so is this like one really data intensive website you're talking about or something like, for instance, Facebook, which just has lots and lots and lots of small tasks which needs to be done with so many users? Here. Okay. Um, that's pretty simple. Um, whenever you... Um, whenever you do some, th some side effect free for each loop, um, or any sort of loop construct that is side effect free where you're not relying on the on the response of the first one or the the, the return code of the first one um, you can actually run it in parallel if you have i don't i doubt there is a, a server out there without a quad core at least quad core mm -hmm. cpu I, I heavily doubt that um, so gbb would uh, start to optimize um, it tries to, to find out how many CPUs you have in your system. It would start to, to distribute threads um, onto as many CPUs as it can get a hold of. Or you can actually manually tune it. But um, by, by default, it would auto-scale to the amount of CPUs you have. And it would start um, using those CPUs right away for everything where you use our uh, parallel for or parallel reduce um, instead of a normal for each loop. And um, 
the the code change is actually pretty small. We've even written um, a, a little pull, uh, PHP plugin that you can plug into a normal send um, PHP to to have the same functionality available just without the the optimization, so that you're not locked in in one way and can't go back with your code base anymore. So you're actually you're not losing anything. You're just calling a normal for each loop or so. Um, so the 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 gains are there from from the moment you start to using a parallel four. Um, the more you optimize your code base, obviously, the better you you you, you use the CPUs under, underneath. For example, if you do the scaling over 100 images, if you do that on on eight cores in parallel, or if you do that serially, is a, is a really big difference. But if you do simple small tasks, the the speed up might not be as much, obviously, as with scaling an image. But it is still noticeable. It is still it is still a speed up. Uh, does using TBB tie you to Intel hardware? Can you could it, can it run on like uh, multiple ARMs and stuff? It's not tied into anything. <laughs> Uh, the TBP library has something called backends, I think. I'm not quite sure. Don't nail me on that one. But there is uh, different uh, hardware architectures that they've actually implemented it against. And um, it is an open library, so everyone can implement whatever he wants to. Um, I'm not sure if the ARM one is there already or not, um, but there is definitely pretty much all other standard CPU architectures there in the moment. So you can deploy onto whatever um, underlying architecture you want to deploy. The, the the Intel approach is not to lock you into Intel products. The Intel approach is to l produce a really good library that can work cross-platform. And um, also with having in mind that if you're using another platform that you can always move to Intel, obviously. <laughs> but the, the idea was to not really lock you into, into something that is Intel only. Also licensing-wise, also hardware-wise. Um, do you think, I think the libraries are really good, I was just wondering if you think in the future if everyone needs to be doing uh, multi-core and threading, maybe we shouldn't be relying on libraries, we'll just need to learn to program. It, like we learn to program in object-oriented ways or do we need to learn to program as students so when we're young kids, <laughs> learn to program in this way and get our mind around it? Um, tricky one. I would I would try to learn the basics of at least how threading works and how, multi, uh, how message passing works. Just the basic concepts behind it. I wouldn't probably set out to write a huge project on a, on a bare bones threading approach. For that I would use Silk or TBB or CUDA or any of the, the, the actual projects that are there for, for writing into, multiple, uh, into massively parallel architectures. and. Um, or use something called Erlang, which is a really, really good language that I love a lot, <laughs> and <laughs> that I'll talk about in my next talk, actually, mm. uh, which is a message passing environment that gives you a lot of that stuff for free already. Um, I, I would, if you're starting out to program, I would learn at least a threading approach and a, multi, uh, and a message passing approach. Mm. Any more questions? So, because we have a couple of minutes, I believe me, just want to insist to invite all of them or at least pass the word about our multicore world conference. We know that we will lose money, but the important thing is that uh, our crusade on making more people aware of the need of parallel programming is something that requires the support of all the community and all the communities. So. Mm, even if you don't remotely plan to attend, I would appreciate if all of you at least pass the parcel, let other people know. You never know who can be out there interested. And we strongly believe that the potential of uh, talent available in the region, in Australia and New Zealand, can make us a global hub on this experience. And that's something that we constantly promote and the people come through the world because these isolated pockets exist here. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Nicholas and Lens, for a very interesting talk. And I've got a uh, small gift for you, thank Nicholas, you. <laughs> um, from the uh, <laughs> organisers. It's a little penguin. OK, thank you very much. Locally made. <laughs> and you'll, you'll get yours in the next session. <laughs>
Okay, our next session starts at 11.30. So